Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Help me. What's, what's that song go? I was going to go to court, but then I got high. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I thought we'd do the recovery version of that song. And this is your part. Because I didn't get high, I didn't get high, I didn't get high. Okay? Let's practice that. Ready? There you go. I got up to clean my room because I didn't get high. No. Hadn't, I hadn't hocked the mop in the vacuum because I didn't get high. <laughs> My house is immaculate. Oh, that's a lie. <laughs> Why? Because I paid all my back child support because I didn't get high. <laughs> when sponsees need help, that's the only time I go to court because I didn't get high. <laughs> <laughs> Got no legal problems, marital IRS, and you know why. I got my son back in recovery because I didn't get high. Most of my family's clean because I didn't get high. I even found the love of my life, and you know why. I've got purpose in my life today because I didn't get high. I walk with a loving God because I didn't get high. And I picked up my double digit coin. And you know why. Thanks. My name's Kermit and I'm an addict. Me, I'm a Kermit and I dick though. See, did I get that right? Nobody said hello, right? <laughs> in, uh, in France, it's mon homme Kermit, je suis dépendant. They're dependents over there. In, uh, yeah, in Germany, it's ich heiße Kermit, ich bin Zustig. <laughs> We're Zustigs in Germany. In, in Israel, it's Kermit Mahor. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> in, in Turkey, it's Benny Adam Kermit, Ben Beer Bulum Liam. <laughs> As, this is the good one. In Greece, it's uh, Milena Kermit Ime Narcomanis. I said to him, Narcomanis, what's that? He said, Narcotic Maniac. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I got to speak in Hawaii. There were some people from Japan, and I said, "Well, well, how do you say my name's Kermit in Japanese?" You know, you know I'm an addict. And she went, "I went." Did you make it shorter? <laughs> she said, "She said Yakachu Kermit." I said, "Okay, Yakachu. What's that?" She said, "Narcotic." <laughs> I said, "Narcotic Kermit." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the committee. Um, this is a great honor for me, a great honor. And, uh, you know, it's an honor for me to be asked to speak at a detox, folks. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and that's the way I look at Sharon. You know, it's an honor. Um, and I also want to give a hand to the other speakers because this is fucking hard, folks. And these people get up and put their heart out. You know. And I've heard some wonderful messages here this weekend. I heard my message yesterday afternoon. 
It was a woman lesbian speaker. <laughs> and she, she said she was Jewish from New York and went to summer camp. <laughs> and had emotional problems. Uh, yep, that's me. <laughs> uh, let's have a moment of silence for me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in my moment of silence, I ask God to relieve me of the bondage of self that I may carry his message and not mine so that no addict seeking recovery need die from the horrors of addiction without having had a chance to find a new way of life and so that we may bear witness to the miracle. And the miracle is when one heart touches another one. You know? I... Um, I walked into my first 12-step meeting in August of 1979. I was in a treatment center wearing what the well-dressed addict wears, (laughs) blue pajamas. (laughs) 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 And this little group of well folks came down the hall to get, you know, when you're in treatment, two weeks you're well, right? (laughs) And they sick you on the newcomers, right? So this little band of well folks came to get me. They were going to carry the light to me and they said we're going to go to this alcohol meeting and I thought you know great I'm a social chameleon I can fit in anywhere you know you tell me the game plan right and so I went down the hall with this little group smiling and you know went in this little treatment room they had one of them little crummy formica tables beat up chairs and it was a little different than this I was 26 years old I was singing in a new wave punk band and I looked around this room and there was these 40 and 50 year old guys and they had big red noses and they had pot bellies out to there and they balled back to there and they said, if you want what we've got. And I said, fuck no. <laughs> I said, I'd be willing to go to any leg not to catch that, whatever it is. <laughs> I quit drinking for the next two years. <laughs> I went through two more treatment centers strung out on heroin, but I was sober. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> I, uh, I made out of that treatment center for, I don't know, 90, 30, 90 something. You know, I used to go to the bars and, you know, where I played and, drink, you know, sit at the bar and drink Coca Colas and show you how cool I was and didn't do any meetings or any of the other stuff they talked about and I relapsed. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I didn't have a re to lapse from. <laughs> it's like. I called the treatment center, you know, and they said, uh, I think I need a refresher course. The first time didn't take. <laughs> They're kind of like the fellowship, you know, they say, we love you, keep coming back. That'll be $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to go through three treatment centers and spend $30,000 to find out that the meetings were free. <laughs> So here I am in my second treatment center. What a treat. I was in there for about two weeks, so I was well. (laughs) Met a girl in there for drug addiction and other symptoms. (laughs) I found out what the other symptoms were. (laughs) Now, it's one thing like when you're 12 or 13 and your parents come in on you and you're playing with yourself bathroom but when you're 27 years old and you get caught naked with a girl in treatment and you got to go to group and apologize (laughs) I'm sorry I threatened her sobriety we'll sit on other sides of the couch can I stay (laughs) selfless service Uh, 
you can see where this is going, right? <laughs> you know, got out of that treatment center, didn't do shit, and showed up in 90 days to the A meeting to pick up your coin, because that's what you did back there. You picked up a white chip, and 90 days later, you got another one. And uh, I, uh, you know, I picked up again, and <clears throat> it was always something innocuous. It was no big deal, you know. I wasn't sticking needles in my arm. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. I was just, it was just a joint. It was just, just a joint. It's just a joint. It's a joint. It's a joint. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one turned into this and that. And, you know, I had, uh, was my son, had, I'd lost my son and my comic book store and my wife and, my, you know, all that stuff already. And uh, my, my wife was up in Boston and I had moved to Virginia on a geographic. And we were supposed to meet up there and I was going to get my son for the summer. It was my brother's high school graduation and I came up early. And my mom left her pocketbook out. <laughs> First National Bank of Mom. <laughs> right? No penalty for any withdrawal, right? <laughs> and I slipped out of 20, you know, and I went in the city to do what I did. And I was only going to do one. And then one turned into five, and it turned into ten, and it turned into me nodding out at the front row of my brother's high school graduation. At 11 o'clock at night, my wife, who'd been to some of these classes... She pulled me aside and she said, you know what? You can't have your son for the summer. I said, well, I can't. She said, no. And you know what? I'm tired of telling him. You're going to tell him. So at 11 o'clock at night, I had to tell this five-year-old boy that he couldn't spend the summer with his dad. And my son looked up to me and he said, well, well why, Daddy? I said, well, you can't. He said, well, well why? He said, because I'm, I'm sick and I can't stop taking drugs and I'm sorry, it's not your fault. And he went and cried to mom and I went to the bathroom to do what I had to do. And I wandered back to Virginia and I got in a relationship with a married woman. Her husband taught at the college. She liked to do the drugs I did. And her husband went away to D.C. for the weekend and she said, come on over. So I came on over. And the guy decided to hitchhike home. Two and a half hours, got back to this little town in Virginia, big hill, climbed this huge hill, happy to be home, got to his house, opened the door, walked up the stairs, happy to be home, opened the door to the fine side of me doing it to his wife, and I was a friend. He said, get out! I got out. <laughs> I went out back and I sat down in my car. And I had all those feelings that we have at the bottom. I felt ashamed. I felt embarrassed. I felt disgusted with myself. You know? I called my therapist. I said, I think I need some help. He said, well, the treatment center won't take you anymore. We only had one. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. I didn't know what to do. And I remember two weeks later, there was some deal at the local mental health. And like somebody was saying Friday night, he said, when the pupil's ready, the teacher will appear, right? And God will move you into the people that, to be with the people that you need to be with, right? If you're in this meeting today and you're a newcomer, there's no mistake, baby. <laughs> right? Right? Somebody's been praying for you. <laughs> right? Um, and I remember there was a local mental health had some deal on it. You know, of course, it was five blocks from my house, right? And I wandered down there and I got this counselor named Martin and I walked in his office and the first thing he says to me, he says, You know Wes? I said, Yeah, he's my dealer. He said, Well, I sent Wes to treatment at the beach and he's got six months clean. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder why the dope was short. <laughs> And he said, we're going to send you. And I was like, oh, no, Martin, I can't go to treatment. You know, and I didn't have any fight left, you know. They just poured me into the car and drove me down. Across the state of Virginia to this little hole-in-the-wall treatment center in Hampton, Virginia, where 30 days before I got there, they started the first NA meeting in that town, in that treatment center. Some people from Virginia Beach were doing H&I. They were bringing it over. I'm clean today through H&I. <laughs> I got in that treatment center and I immediately noticed a serious architectural defect in the planning of the building. <laughs> I wanted to let them know right away. <laughs> there was no doorknob on my side of the door. <laughs> 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 it 
And uh, so I'm sitting here twitching and growling in my blue pajamas and, you know, feeling like, you know, three time loser. I'm never going to make it. And the little group of well people came down the hall to get me. <laughs> and they said the words that were going to change my life. They said, Would you like to go to an NA meeting? I said, Yeah. You know, because I'd heard in, in the mountains where we went to meetings in AA that there was this place called Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, I walked into that meeting, and folks, I weighed 100 pounds less than I do today. My skin was kind of yellow. My hair was matted up. My tooth was chipped in half. I had athlete's foot and God knows what else. And when, I, when I sat down in that meeting, I knew that the women were checking me out. <laughs> <laughs> Regular stud muffin, yeah. <laughs> See, my world was so crazy, I had to build a world around me that I could be comfortable in, you know. And they read out a little white book, and, and they read, you know, we were addicts and that we lived to use and used to live. And I said, yeah, you know. And he said that, you know, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. And I thought, God, they're being kind. <laughs> you know, I, I, I went through treatment the way I always do treatment. You know, <laughs> getting groups, you got to get honest, motherfucker. <laughs> right? <laughs> He's got me, right? I love it, you know. Newcomers, they want to do three steps, right? One, nine, and twelve, right? I surrender, I sorry, I help you. <laughs> right? Oh, you see these guys at the, you know, the, I do H and I, and I'm in the treatment center, and through the whole meeting, these guys in the front row with his hand up like a horse shack, you know, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. <laughs> so you pick him, right? You know what he's going to say, right? And he gets up there. And, <sighs> I've been working the first three steps with my sponsor, <laughs> been making amends to my family, <laughs> getting ready to do my fourth step. <laughs> These have been the best two days of my life. <laughs> I identify. <laughs> oh, God. I remember I had three weeks clean, right? About 21 days and trying to get a dope fiend to get out of treatment, right? And they had a... They had one of them uh, NA speaker meetings, right? And they had this guy get up, and oh, he was rough. I mean, he had motorcycle, you know, chains down to his nuts and everything. <laughs> yeah. hey, I was in blue pajamas, right? You want a piece of me? <laughs> I was scared to death of this guy, right? He was tough, right? This guy got up, and he told the worst war story you ever heard, because that's all we had back then, right? <laughs> This guy talked about being, he'd been in and out of 12 treatment centers in state psychiatric hospitals, been in and out of prison. He had 40 white chips. That's an outfit, like a belt, a choker. <laughs> hey, You know, and they, at, at the end of the meeting, he sat back down and, and they called him back up and they gave him his one year medallion. Yeah. You know, I thought, a year, that's forever. <laughs> you know, I thought, if that son of a bitch can stay clean, so can I. That son of a bitch is Billy E. And this year he celebrated 21 years clean in narcotics and all So I got to the end of my treatment stay, and I, you know, doing it my way still, right? And I, you know, I, I decided, you know, that um, I should speak to my higher power about this because they wanted me to go to the halfway house for six months. So I decided to call on my higher power. I don't, her name's Patty. Do you know? <laughs> 
I called my girlfriend up. I said, I think I should go to the halfway house for six months. She said, oh, no, you have to come home. I cry all the way. You know, I said, what should I tell him? She said, tell him you made your mind up. <laughs> so I went back to group. I've made my mind up. <laughs> And they weaseled it out of me. They had one of those super groups, you know, my group, the group next door, and all the doctors <laughs> trying to tell little Kermit to surrender. <laughs> they got it out of me. If I go to treatment, if I go to the halfway house, she'll leave me and my life won't be worth living. Oh. <laughs> we were married a year later, and nine months after that, we were annulled, and my life's been great ever since. <laughs> <laughs> So much for I thought. So that's the way I left treatment with everybody telling me I was going to be loaded by nightfall. <laughs> Basically, they were right, right. Went across the state of Virginia through Richmond out to the mountains and I saw the sign that said seven miles to town and the disease started talking. And it was loud. You know. Where can we get some dope? Where can we get some money? What kind of story can we tell the connection? I was like, shh, we're in a Honda. She's going to hear you. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> I moved out of my brother's house because he was shooting heroin, so I moved in, I made, moved in with, decided to move in with my best friend who was only dealing cocaine. <laughs> I made a decision. <laughs> so I laid down in this empty hippie pad in the basement apartment where he'd thrown a mattress in the floor of an empty room, and that's where I came back from treatment. And I laid down on that mattress with Patty next to me, and I started shaking. I was right between the rock and the hard place, you know, where I was going to do what I always did when I had a feeling that was uncomfortable, which was run or use or do something else. And something inside of me cracked, and I turned to her and I said, Patty, you know, all I want to do is get away from you and find some dope, and I'm really scared, and I don't know how to do this shit, you know. And she said, you know, there's an A meeting tonight, and that's all we had, and uh, I can take you to that. And I said, okay. And she said, you know, we can go to my folks to get something to eat. And I said, okay. And that's what I did. Now, friends, in the mountains of Virginia in 1981, they were not thrilled to see drug addicts in their AA meetings. <laughs> I sat down at an AA meeting with as much people in this center section, right? And everybody's going around saying, hi, my name's Joe. I'm an alcoholic. And, then, and it came back to me. I said, my name's Kermit, and I'm a drug addict. And three people said hello. And I didn't care, you know. And it came around to me at the end, and I, you know, raised my hand, and I said, you know, my name's Kermit, and I'm a drug addict. I still had adjectives back then. And I said, uh, you know, all I'm thinking about is getting high, and I really don't know, you know. And this little redneck was sitting next to me. He had a shit-eating grin on his face, right? He had the answer, right? The guy was just smiling. <laughs> <He's> just <laughs> smiling. You won't believe what he says to me. Get this. He says... Just don't get high today. <laughs> I, said, I said, run that by me again. You mean till I go to bed? He said, yeah. I said, oh, I wonder why I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, so I went to bed that night clean. And I woke up, yeah, and I woke up the next morning free. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm not saying I hadn't had a burning desire to use since that day, because I've had some barn burners. But, but I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I never had to use again the rest of my life, one day at a time in the 12-step meetings. September 6th, I celebrated 20 years clean in Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> And I made a second surrender that next morning, and that was the second half of the first step. <laughs> it's the part we always miss. <laughs> that my life was none of my business. <laughs> my life had become unmanageable, not manageable. Every time I managed my life, I ended up in blue pajamas. <laughs> I figured that, right? I went to every meeting that we had. We had like eight meetings a week, and I went to the, see this drug counselor, me and Wes, this tall brother. And after about four months, Wes Martin looked at me and Wes, and he pulled out this little thing, and he said, why don't you go start an A meeting? I thought, 
Cool. <laughs> Wonder why I didn't think of that, you know? I, I love Dan A. Folks, I'm not a good leader, right? I'm not even a good follower. I get lost, right? <laughs> But this guy gave us this thing, you know, this little kit, and I was on fire, man. I was the committee. <laughs> I was the literature committee, the PI committee, the phone was at my... I was chairman of G&I. Guilt and intimidation. It's my favorite committee. I see we have some local chapter presidents up here. So we sent flyers out all over the place to, you know to get addicts to come to our N.A. meeting. <laughs> I dropped some off at the university hospital and about a week before the meeting, I get a call from this guy. He says, uh, he says you know, I'm from the uh, University of Virginia, uh, psych floor, uh, sixth floor psych ward. We've got this 14-year-old girl up here. She's been up here eating speed. It's her third time trying to commit suicide, and we don't know what to say to her anymore. Would you come and talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> the big guru with four months. What the fuck I know? <laughs> but since I was the committee, I said, okay. <laughs> I don't know, 12-step call two people. You know, I just showed up, right? And they gave us two chairs and we sat down. Now, when you've been using for like 15 years and you've got four months to recover, what are you going to talk about, right? <laughs> for an hour and 20 minutes, I told this poor little girl every rotten, nasty, scummy, disgusting thing I'd ever done in my whole life. <laughs> And in the last five minutes, I said, and I have four months clean, and I go to N.A. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, okay. <laughs> she was nodding in all the appropriate places, going, yep, yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> she was identifying, you know. And God bless her mother trusted her enough, you know, trusted us enough to come pick her up. Her, her name was Jennifer, and um, she was having a little trouble with the one day at a time, you know. She'd... Um, She'd go a few days and then eat some speed and go a few days and eat some speed. And, you know, and somebody was giving her a ride home one night and said, well, Jennifer, you're having trouble with this one day at a time stuff. He said, why don't you not use from tonight's meeting till tomorrow night's meeting? And she looked at him and said, I wonder why I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this January, Jennifer celebrated 20 years clean in narcotics. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't have any literature, you know, because I was the literature committee. <laughs> I took the who, what, how, why pamphlet and made a hundred copies, and that was our literature. <laughs> what, oh, and we had little poker chips. I got poker chips and put little NAs on <laughs> Bet your life on NA. Yeah, have a chip. <laughs> so... Uh, what we had was we had the therapeutic value of one addict helping another, which is without parallel, period. Yeah. And uh, I, was, uh, I had about nine months clean, and I decided with no sponsor that at nine months I should be on step three. <laughs> so... So this is how I decided I was going to work step three, right? I said, I'm going to look for God's will in everything, right? Okay, we come up to a red light, and I go, okay, this must be God's will, because there's going to be an accident up ahead, and he's stopping me before this... A, a, a napkin would fall off a table. It's a sign from God. <laughs> but it's the whole deal, you know, where's God? You know, I tell sponsors, you want to find God? He's right on the other side of willingness, right? And I was willing, right? And I get into Patty's car. I still don't have a car yet, right? And she gives me the mail, and I'm looking through, and it's a, a letter from the sheriff's department. I knew they wanted me to come speak. <laughs> and I open up this letter, and it's a warrant, right? Something I know you guys never did, right? <laughs> Writing checks, knowing there's no funds in the account, right? So I'm mad, right? I'm doing all this good shit. I'm clean. I'm doing the N.A. stuff. And I, I take this letter, right? And I hold it up in the sky and I said, All right, God, what do you want me to do about this one? And the Beatles song, Let It Be, came on the radio. <laughs> Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. I thought, 
shit I've heard from the Almighty, Paul McCartney. <laughs> I mean, that was as close to let go and let God as you get, right? <laughs> so I figured I'm going to let go and let God, right? I'm going to turn this problem over to God and I'm going to act as if he's got it already taken care of, all right? And I'm just going to do the next right thing and, you know, not worry about it. And I did. I really let go and, until like the night before and I started getting... And then the day of court, I was a nervous wreck, right? So, <laughs> went down to court and I sat in the back row where all the guilty people sit, right? <laughs> I love what Richard Pryor says. I went there for justice and that's what I found. Just us. <laughs> Every time I go to court with sponsees, I want to bring a stack of white books. 30 days, have a white book. <laughs> Drunk and disorder, have a white book. So I'm sitting in the back, right? They should, shouldn't they? Call the, call the BI committee. Let's get on this thing, right? So I'm sitting in the back, right? And I'm getting ready to do that long walk, right? Because it's the judge. <laughs> You know the judge. <laughs> the one who said, if I see you here again in my court, I'm going to try you to the full... <laughs> that judge. <laughs> so I'm dressed nice. I got a suit on. I got my big book under my arm. Right? And, I'm <laughs> and, I, and I'm doing the long walk, you know. God, Graham is ready. God, Graham is ready. <laughs> I get up to the front, you know, he says... He says, Mr. Osman, he said, you want to tell us something about this check? I said, well, Your Honor, I... He said, hold it. And he calls the lawyer over for Safeway and supermarket chain. And he says, Counselor, he says, do you recognize that this check's a year old? And the lawyer said, well, yes, Your Honor. He said, well, you can't prosecute this man in a criminal case for a check that's a year old. He said, well, I can't. He said, no. He said, now you can prosecute him in a civil suit unless, Mr. Osmond, you're here to pay what you owe. <laughs> what do you think I said? <laughs> yes, Your Honor, that's what I'm here to do. He said, <laughs> pay the man $32, case dismissed. <laughs> I have had a deep faith in the God of my understanding since that day. <laughs> and honey, when the music plays, I listen. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I got all involved in service, group, area, region, world, cat, dog, anything, anything they give me a title for, right? <laughs> and uh, ran all over the place and... Uh, I, uh, I, hit, I hit an emotional bottom at five years, completely crazy, right? Nuts. You know, lots of shopping, right? <laughs> Please, five credit cards, right? Up to limit, three times, right? Doing good. <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you call that? Polyaddicted, right? <laughs> Polyurethane. <laughs> uh, so I... I went looking for some help. I was at the 5th Virginia Convention, and, and, um, and there was a guy there. He was a quiet-spoken guy. He was like a natural kind of leader that he just naturally led, you know, soft-spoken, you know, and less clean time than me. And, and I grabbed him on the steps, you know, and he knew I was going to talk about some shit because I was a purist radical. And uh, I, said, uh, um, I said, Michael, and I hadn't done this in a while, I said, would you be my sponsor? And tears came up in his eyes. And he said, I'd be honored to be your sponsor. Honored. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was, right? He says, where are you at with these steps? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> One. You tell me. I'm... <laughs> he said, well, you know, what's the, what's the last thing you've done? And I said, well, I wrote out the first three steps and I sent them to my sponsor in Tennessee. I had a sponsor 900 miles away, right? And... Uh, and he said, good. He said, we're going to do a four-step. I said, great. <laughs> I can screw up for a year now, baby. <laughs> Give me that pamphlet with the 500 questions about your mother's sex life and everything. <laughs> we had a killer four-step back then, right? <laughs> and, you know, and I thought I was going to hide. He said, no, no. He said, I just want you to write about three things. I said, three things? Shit. I said, What's that? He said, resentment, sex, and fear. <laughs> So I could do that in a sentence. I was resentful and fearful that my wife wouldn't give me sex. <laughs> I said, no. He said, 
He said, and we're going to make an appointment for a fifth step. I said, a what? He said, an appointment. He said, I said, why is that? He said, well, f- four steps are really nine and 20. I said, nine and 20? He said, yeah, nine months to worry about it, 20 minutes to write it. <laughs> said, I'll give you a deadline and you'll, ah, I hate when they're right around here. <laughs> and that's what I did. You know, I went home and sat down to write, you know, and there's something magical about writing. You know, it's like, why would you lie to yourself on a piece of paper to yourself? You know? <laughs> Oh, I know we have some of these, you know, the greatest story ever told, right? <laughs> they come to you with a toilet paper roll, you know, this will only take a couple of hours. <laughs> so I started writing, you know, and I was doing travel agent stuff, so I was typing and, you know, and I, and I started writing and I said, I felt abandoned when Georgie left home. And I started to cry. And that had happened when I was like 14 years old. My older sister had moved out. And, uh, you know, my house. (laughs) Let me tell you about my family. (laughs) This is our theme song. Doodly doo. Doodly doo. (laughs) Oh, God. Right? You look up dysfunctional in the dictionary, there's a picture of my family smiling. (laughs) Oh, God. So I wrote out this inventory and I got to the end and I sat down. Michael did this, you know, set up for a fifth step at a botanical garden at sunset, you know, in a set up. I I tell you, the best story I ever heard about a fifth step, right? This, this This guy's... doing his fifth step with a sponsor and the sponsor says you know read what's on the paper and add on and the sponsor's reading and he's adding and he's reading and he's adding and he's eight hours of reading and I finally finishes and the sponsor says is that it and the guy says yep that's it he says you sure he says yep yep nothing else that, that's it he says you sure he says yep yep so well give me a hug I'll see you at the meeting and the sponsor starts to leave his sponsor's apartment he gets almost out to the door and he yells back the one thing he says I fucked the chicken. <laughs> and his sponsor yells back, Did yours die too? Oh, honey, there's only so many things that the human mind and body can perform, and we've done them all, right? <laughs> so if you think your stuff so weird that you're going to be rejected, forget it. Because <laughs> if I haven't did it, I've heard a dozen people, you know. So I do my inventory with my sponsor, and I told him all about my chickens, right? <laughs> and then he told me about his, and I went, oh, you're sick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, so yeah, so are you, my friend, and that's why we're working these steps, right? <laughs> uh, and at the end of that inventory, right, when I'd finished and shared all my pain and all my hurt and all my sorrows and my loss, and he, he took that my step and he rolled it up in a little tube and he held it in front of my eyes. And he said, not forever and not for always. But at this moment in time, are you entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character? Not forever, but just right now. All this pain, all this hurt. And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And we bowed our heads and we shared that willingness with God. And we went back to his house in Virginia Beach and we got on the lawn, on his front lawn, him Christian, me Jew, and we put those papers in a pile And he said, what's your favorite prayer? And I said, just for today. And we lit him on fire. We said, just for today. And we humbly asked God to remove our shortcomings. And I like to say, if you get real spiritual and you write your resentments on a piece of paper and light them on fire, they'll be gone. (laughs) Addicts would be running around here, burn this shit, burn this shit. (laughs) No, defects and shortcomings are removed through action and prayer. Action and prayer. And what happened to me in 6 and 7 was that my defects became real to me. It's like, before that they were kind of hidden and I was, could bullshit myself, but now they were like a 2 by 4 you know? <laughs> like, 
I think I'll lust after that girl at the dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you went home alone the last five times. Boom! <laughs> I think I'll spend on that credit card. That'll make me feel better. Yeah, but you're paying off five other ones. Boom! <laughs> Start reeling, you know. I hit a bottom at a regional, you know. They were supposed to elect me RSR alternate. <laughs> and they elected somebody else. <laughs> and he didn't even have the clean time requirement. <laughs> Didn't they know who I was? <laughs> yeah, that's why they didn't elect you, right? <laughs> God knew who I was, right? God didn't want me running around all over the place. He wanted me to sit still and do my work, you know? And I went to Michael with this thing, and, you know, he was H&I chair, and we sat down, and, you know, he said, we're going to do something special on this deal. I went, oh, shit, here it comes, <laughs> right? He said, I want you to go home and write down everything you're doing or not doing that's keeping you from God's will for you. Ew. Now, when you're on six and seven for a while, you know, basically it boils down to just a handful of shit. And it's right up here because you've been using all your effort to keep it back in, right? So I sat down and wrote down this list. And, you know, I got to get up with my son. I got my son back in recovery. You know? You know, my wife had married my, my running partner. They were both trashed all the time. And I was in recovery and wasn't ready and couldn't take care of them. And God brought a woman into my life. And the next day or the next week that she had decided that she was going to move in with me, my ex called me and said, I have to go to treatment. Would you take your son back? I didn't have to serve papers. I didn't have to do nothing. God said, here. You know? And yeah. And we got him, I got him in the wonder years. It was a wonder I didn't kill him. <laughs> you know, because he was full of resentment, I was full of resentment. We had to grow up together, you know. And that's one of my sad dilemmas, you know. It's like, I want to say that Narcotics Anonymous saved my life and transformed my life so much that it saved my son's life and transformed my son. My son is manic depressive. And this just happened in the last, like, four years. And, um, like, <clears throat> about three months ago, I got an email from him, and I was, in, I was in Alabama, and he was in Boston, and the email said, this is a suicide note. And my son was staying at his mom's, and uh, I didn't know her number, and I called the police, and they went up there, and they... They went to the, my mom, his wife's, and, and, and Candy thought, no, nothing's wrong, but she thought maybe I should go out to the beach where he always hangs out, and went out to the beach and found the van out there, and the beach was closing, and they got him one of those scooter things to go out on the sand, and, and there he was. He had eaten a bottle of Prozac and drank a bottle of NyQuil, and his phone was open to my number. He was trying to call me. And... Um, they, they got him and they took him to the hospital and they pumped his stomach and, they, um, and, uh, and he's doing better. Um, I, um, you know, I was, <clears throat> I looked at this list and it was, you know, I got to get up in the morning with my son and stay up. I would get up and wake him up and then go to sleep on the couch, you know. Um, and, you know, i got to quit procrastinating. <laughs> Why put off till tomorrow what you can put off till the day after tomorrow, right? <laughs> that, was, yeah, that was my biggest... Oh, if you stop procrastinating, if you just did everything today, you know, instead of when it needed to be done, guess what? <laughs> You'd be happy, joyous, and free, right? Oh, no, we can't do that. <laughs> the negative committee. <laughs> and, you know, there was a couple other ones. i got to quit playing with myself. I did that every day whether I needed it or not, right? <laughs> Oh, I just mentioned that because always at the end of the convention, somebody comes up to me. Man, I really got to talk to you about this problem I'm having. I was wondering, could you lend me a hand? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but I put all this stuff on that list and I looked at it and I went, nah. <laughs> put it down. I woke up the next morning and I said, that's it. I surrender. I'm tired. Running my game for the glorious ability to be right. 
Oh, yeah, old Kermit killed himself. Yeah, but he was right. <laughs> Willing to go to any lake just to be right. Yeah. I remember going back over to, to the other part of Virginia where I got clean and, and walking down the street. And I walked past the ghetto where I used to shoot dope. And it dawned on me that I didn't know what it felt like to be that guy that had run in that street. I had changed that much. Having had a spiritual awakening, right? Yeah. I made a list of all persons who had harmed me and I made sure they made amends to me. No. <laughs> I made a list, I went over with my sponsor, and I went, you know, a bunch of them were in New York City, so I actually flew up to see them, and my grandmother was here, my brother was here, my sister was there, and I did them one, two, three, and there was an NA meeting down at the, in uh, St. Mark's Place in the village, and I had it set up that I could go to the How Club, boom, 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 and recovery. And I left my brother, and I went down to the How Club, and I got out of the cab, and walking down the street was a girl from summer camp that was a lot younger than me that I was taken advantage of when we were kids. She was in recovery. And I said, okay, God. And Amy and I sat down on a seat right next to the How Club, and I got to make amends to her. Um, the, um, the tenth step for me... And said, these are not necessarily the views of Narcotics Anonymous. They're what worked for me. So if you want what I have, you may need more therapy. <laughs> right. I was listening to this guy in 1982 at the in Georgia convention, you know, and he said, man, if you want what I got, get off your ass and get it. Right. And I said, shit, <laughs> this must be a real drug addict. <laughs> I um, You know, 10th step for me is where I go deep inside and I heal everything, you know. I go all the way back to my childhood and I heal all of it, you know. It's like a deeper working of my 6th and 7th step, you know. And, um, you know, I grew up, my father was a, a rich cigar smoking lawyer and he disappeared at a very early age. And I, so I was basically raised by my mother. When my father left, my mother was a depressive, she let the house go to pieces and she let the cats and dogs shit and piss all over the house and didn't clean up after them and we lived in one of the wealthiest suburbs in New York and everybody else's home was manicured lawns manicured kids manicured everything you know and I was from the crazy house you know um, later on when I went away to school the dog uh, fell in the pool that hadn't been any water in it for years and he died a great Dane, and she left him there for a year until the SPCA came and picked him up. My stepmother, my father got married to my stepmother, and on a trip back from private school one time, they pulled out a joint. <laughs> and I got high the first time with my parents, right? And my stepmother and I became fast bonded buddies. We were pals, we were tight. And we had a little baby brother, Michael, he's five years old, cute, blonde haired, cute cute, cute, fun, loving, smiley, happy, all the time kid. We all loved him. And, and Dad had an apartment in the Bronx, and, and Michael was sitting on the ledge, and he heard a siren, and he wanted to see what it was. He put his hand on the screen, and the ledge, the screen fell through. He dropped 13 floors and died. And my stepmother, the only one that was in my corner, she picked up a bottle and drank a fifth a day for the next 20 years until it killed her. She ended up bleeding and hemorrhaging to death in an apartment in Queens because nobody would go to her anymore. You know? The, um, you know, I used to go to family functions with my wife, <laughs> the plaintiff, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> my former wife, right? Party of the first part, right? <laughs> and we used to leave these family functions. She'd go, it's amazing that what you come from, from this, <laughs> you know. Because she was like from Michigan, you know, white people. <laughs> so the whitest people I've ever met up there, you know. <laughs> uh, 
the uh, the eleventh step. I have trouble keeping my mind shut up long enough to sit still. You know, my sponsor told me he said, "Get a birthday candle, a little birthday candle, put it on the little thing, light it, and sit there. And when it goes out, you can get up." <laughs> Fuck that shit. <laughs> I couldn't sit for a minute, right? So what I decided to do was I was going to repeat positive stuff over and over again, and that would be my meditation. That's my form of meditation. And I would repeat stuff. You know, they told me in early in treatment, the guy said to me, oh, he was, you know, he had six months. He was God, right? <laughs> you know, in our little group therapy session. He said, repeat as often as you can, if God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, who... and I would do that. I'd swim laps. You know, if God is for me, who can be against me? <laughs> and I realized after about 10 or 11 years, I thought one day, if God is for me, why am I against me? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and my other favorite one is whatever's going on in my life, God has it already taken care of. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I just repeat it and repeat it. <laughs> it tells people. <sighs> um, you know, I was thinking about this. The 12th step is... The spiritual principle behind the 12th step is unconditional love, right? We always say that. We always say... Nobody talks about it. You know? I finally realized that when you surrender and you get rid of defects of character and you get rid of your shortcomings, you get rid of all that shit, you don't have any more conditions on helping somebody. You know? I will help you regardless of whether you're trying to screw my wife. Regardless of whether you've been in this thing or you've got that color or you've got this scent or you've got this shit or you, or you might want my money or you might want... You know, there are no conditions on my love. I will carry the message to anybody who wants it. You know? I, um, I, go, I, I went to the, to the first Virginia Convention, Narcotics Anonymous, and there was a guy there from Connecticut, and this guy, Danny Sullivan, he's passed away. And I said, Danny, man, I got a couple of really good sick ones up in Connecticut, right? My sister and, you know, her husband, he's in prison doing a three-year bid for dope. And she's, you know, the good prison wife, right, bringing the dope in every week. I said, I can't really help him, you know. And, you know, and his is, if you ain't got dope, don't come up, right, that shit. So I said, I can't really help him. Would you give him a call? Now, this guy went back to Connecticut and he spent a dime, right, and five minutes of his time. And he called my sister Juliet, and he used an attic, you know, and she was like, yeah, man, cool, yeah, cool. You know, we're not going to go down to the avenue anymore. We're going to send someone else. <laughs> that shit will work for an hour, right? <laughs> and that's what happened. Michael got out of prison, and about the third run, he decided he was going to go himself, and it was a sting, and they nailed him. And they carted him back to prison. And my sister Juliet called that guy, Danny Sullivan, and he got her to a meeting that night. And she kicked in their bathtub. And about a month ago, I received an email and it said, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19. She had 19 years clean in our cosmetics. My, my father remarried, his stepmother's got 16 years clean in narcotics anonymous. My, my youngest brother has just celebrated 10 years clean. And my two sisters in the last uh, 90 days both picked up white chips. And my brother, my running partner, my buddy, you know, the guy we always got each other out of shits, you know. You know, I got him, you know, I tried to try to sell this stuff to him real early on, and he didn't want it. And then he came in, and he came out, and he came in. And one of his trips out, he picked up the virus. And seven years ago, we buried him from AIDS. And uh, a few, uh, a month ago... We were supposed to take my dad on a cruise for his 75th birthday, and the weekend before we were coming down to Florida, he was trying to get everything done in his life so he could be free to go on his cruise, and he had a heart attack. And we flew down, and instead of being on a cruise with my dad, I was sitting in the intensive care for the week. And at the end of the week, we chose to pull the plug, and we buried him next to my brother Barney. And... Uh, 
you know, being Jewish and being the eldest son, I get to read the prayer every day for 11 months. So I get to spend more time with my dad in the hereafter than I ever did in my life. You know. I owe everything I have to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I, um, you know, <clears throat> at 11 years clean, I had a codependent meltdown. <laughs> having, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these 12 steps, <laughs> at 11 years clean, I had a codependent meltdown. I lost my house, my wife, my business, a half a million dollars, and ended up owing the IRS 150 grand. Newcomers keep coming back. It gets better. <laughs> And all this pain, right, drove me to go deal with my childhood, right? And when all this work was done, I left Virginia. I went to New York. And, uh, and on a retreat back in Virginia, I met this young lady who had, her life was falling apart. And, and she asked me if she could call me because she wanted to know how I'd gotten from divorce to happy in a year, right? <laughs> Always looking for the quick out, right? <laughs> and, uh, so she just called me and we were just sharing one addict to another, you know, and she said, you know, her mom died and she was an only child and her mom was the most important thing in her life and, and uh, she was crying every day and uh, decided to treat herself like a newcomer. Just go to meetings, take suggestions, use phone numbers, lean up against people and ask for help. You know, she had, you know, I don't know, eight, nine years clean at the time. And... Um, she went to a meeting one night and she was sitting afterwards and this guy Omar was, you know, one of the leaders in Baltimore. He said, you know, she said to him, I don't know, Omar, you know, maybe, maybe God has some plan for me, but I don't know. And Omar looked at her and he said, Jamise, God most certainly has a plan for you and it's better than anything you could ever dream of. And yeah, and she, she hung on to that, you know, she hung on to that just those words, you know, and, and would say, you know, sometimes she'd sit up at night and she said, you know, God, if you got a plan for me, you better fucking reveal it pretty soon because <laughs> I don't know how much more I got, you know. And, uh, you know, we got together for a weekend and, man, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I started asking her to marry me that weekend, right? You know, and when you tell the, you know, N.A. people, you know, I wanted to get married right away, they go, oh, <laughs> the negative committee shows, oh, you can't do that. you got to know for six months, find out who she really is. <laughs> <laughs> when God touches two people's hearts like he's touched ours, there's no maybe about it. Yep. <laughs> two years ago, we were, we were married and... Um, you know, last year, I think it was, we went to, I spoke in Palm Springs, and we were in San Diego at the Hilton there, and, and we, they had a deal where you could rent a yacht, you know, and it was a couple hundred bucks. It was our anniversary, so I said, I could do something special, rent a yacht. <laughs> and I did it, right, and I, you know, brought her up onto the thing, and, you know, I said, you know, the captain comes up, he said, ready to get on board? I said, absolutely. She goes, you rented the yacht. <laughs> And we got on this yacht, and we're going out in San Diego Harbor, and there's the only music in the thing was Frank Sinatra, right? <laughs> so we plug old Frank in there, and I'm standing on this yacht with the love of my life in San Diego Harbor, getting ready to speak in front of 4,000 NA members, and Frank's singing, That's life. <laughs> <laughs> Shot down in March and up in May, right? And I, and I thought to myself, you know, when my life was falling apart and that 11-year madness, if I'd have used, I'd have missed the whole thing, you know. Don't stop five minutes before the miracle. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like I said, I'm going to wind this up. Everything I owe, everything I have, I owe to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, my health, my sanity, my wife my family, everything I have, I owe to Narcotics Anonymous and a loving God. And when somebody asks me to do something for NA, I don't have the heart to say no. You know? I went to a convention in Georgia in 1982, and this woman from Nashville was there, and she sang a song. And, and it was so beautiful, and it was so meaningful. I said, I said, Gail, can I use that in my talk? She said, oh, it's a gift from God, pass it on. And it sums up everything that I believe about Narcotics Anonymous. And it's called The Last Time I Saw Michael. 
Someone introduced us somewhere. I don't remember now. I guess we started talking, but I don't know what about. Michael was from Florida by way of NYC. And from that moment on, he became a friend to me. Well, we always used to see him, and sometimes we'd drop by. And every time he'd be alone, just trying to get high. The high was never high enough. He tried day after day. And helplessly I watched his spirit simply slip away. God, he used to sit and brag the money and the dope he had. But I just can't forget how sad Michael looked to me. Well, I read the evening papers. They called it heart attack. But I know damn full and well he overdosed on smack. So now the party's over. They've gone and rented out his space. I never will quite forget the look on Michael's face. God, he used to sit and brag the money and the dope he had. But I just can't forget how sad Michael looked to me. Well, I'd like to say in closing, the story's sad but true. And somewhere lives a Michael in me and all of you. And I am deeply grateful for what I have today because I would be where he is if it wasn't for N.A. Thank you.